Welcome to session number two of week seven in virology part one. This week we're talking about viral DNA synthesis. And in this video we're going to talk about the lessons we have learned about DNA replication using a small DNA virus called SV40, simian virus number 40. Now this is a virus with a rather small uh, genome. It's a double-stranded DNA circle of about 5,000 uh, kilobase pairs. I, sh I should say 5,000 base pairs or 5 kilobase pairs. This DNA has a single origin of replication. And the origin of replication is the defined specific place in the genome from which DNA replicates initially. Now, our chromosomes have many, many origins of replication. Uh, if they only had one per chromosome, it would take many, many days to duplicate each chromosome, uh, which would not be compatible with, with our lives. So we have hundreds and hundreds of origins of replication, each uh, initiating rounds of DNA replication. Uh, before the SV40 genome was used as a model for DNA replication, we could not study uh, origins of our DNA replication because we didn't know where they were. But if you take a molecule of SV40 DNA and you put it in an extract of cells, it will replicate. And from those in vitro experiments, we were able to identify the origin of replication, identify in vitro systems that allow replication, origin-dependent replication, and eventually those could be used to study cellular replication. But a great deal has been learned about the basics of DNA replication using SV40. And this is what I'd like to tell you about in this segment. So uh, SV40 is a circular molecule, and it is replicated as a circle. It is not linearized. Uh, the replication, the DNA replication, initiates at this origin of replication and then proceeds in both directions from the origin. So the DNA is replicated in a bidirectional fashion. All that means is that there is synthesis in both directions from the origin. So when that happens, you can imagine that you get a bubble of double-stranded DNA as shown here, and the bubble will increase in size with time. So in fact, if you replicate SV40 in vitro for different amounts of time and then look at the products in an electron microscope, you will see these bubbles growing bigger and bigger, and that's what's shown in the panel of figures at the top. Now on the left is early after the initiation of DNA synthesis, and you can see a very small bubble here. Uh, this bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the replication forks, and there are two of them, move away from the origin of replication. So early in replication, you have a small bubble, shown here. As the replication forks move to the left and the right, the bubble gets bigger. So this bubble is made of double-stranded DNA, and there's a fork at either end, and somewhere in the middle would have been the origin of replication. So that's how the origin of SV40 works, and again, it's the starting site for DNA synthesis. Uh, the DNA synthesis occurs in a bidirectional manner in both directions from the origin, uh, and results in the production of two replication forks. So let's explore how this happens. Here is a schematic of the replication fork, and not only is DNA synthesis bidirectional, as I've already told you, it's happening in both directions from the origin, leading to this bubble, two replication forks, but it is semi discontinuous. Ah, what does that mean? All right. Now, as we are making DNA on, on this um, bubble, if you will, some strands, it's very easy to make DNA. Let's take this red one right here, which we've labeled the leading strand. There are actually two of them. There's a leading strand here and a leading strand here. Uh, this kind of synthesis can proceed in a five to three prime direction, nonstop, because the template is being read in a three prime to five prime direction. The polymerase simply crawls along the template and synthesizes DNA 
in a five to three prime direction. And the polymerase complex ends up pushing the fork more and more to the left here. The bubble gets bigger and bigger. The same way uh, on the lower leading strand, the DNA polymerase continuously makes DNA. It's called continuous DNA synthesis. That's part of the name here. And pushes the replication fork to the right. That's why they're called the leading strands. They happen first, and they lead DNA synthesis. Now, and that's also part of the continuous name. But we also have semi-discontinuous. What's that all about? Well, the other part of the bubble is labeled lagging strands here and here. Now here, because of the way DNA synthesis begins, at the origin, you cannot synthesize DNA from right to left here. That would be in the wrong direction. You have to always synthesize it 5 to 3 prime, reading the template in a 3 to 5 prime direction. So there's no way the polymerase could go in two directions from the origin. So once the bubble is a certain size, the polymerase can initiate, say, up here and synthesize in a 5 to 3 prime direction. As the bubble get big, gets bigger, it puts down another small piece of DNA. And as the bubble grows, you put small fragments of DNA. This may seem inefficient, but it's in fact the only way to do it because you can only make DNA in a certain direction, as we've said before. So this is called the lagging strand because it occurs after the leading strand is made, and that is because the bubble has to open up a bit in order for the polymerase to have some template to work with here. So there are two lagging strands and there are two leading strands. All of these are primed with RNA. Those are the green molecules here. Short segments of RNA are primers for DNA synthesis. They're put down by one of the polymerases. Uh, and the short fragments that are made on the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments after the scientist who discovered them. So at the bottom here is a linear schematic of how this works. You start with a double-stranded DNA template. You make uh, two daughter strands on the two original templates. So let's look at these by color. We have a blue strand and a light blue strand. The blue, these are denatured in the replication bubble. The, the dark blue strand is copied. Here, the product is red. The light blue strand, the other strand is also copied. The product is pink. They are both linked to RNA primers. The RNA primers have to be removed and filled in. And that's not a problem because this is a circular RNA. So you're always going to have a three prime hydroxyl ahead of you to fill in when you remove the RNA primer. No matter, there's no end to give you a five prime end problem. So this is one solution, one viral solution to the end problem. Make a circle. That way you always have a free end to serve as a primer. So for example, you remove this RNA primer. You can prime synthesis to fill in the gap at this three prime end. You remove this RNA primer. You can use this three prime end. Same for here and same for the very ultimate uh, primer because it's just a circle. It's always going to be, there's always going to be a three prime, five prime end. So that's how SV40 and other circular DNA uh, genomes solve this five prime end problem. So let's look in detail how this whole process starts. And this is probably how our cells do it with some modification. Now, here at the top is a segment of the SV40 genome. As you know, it's circular, but we're only showing a short piece here. It looks like double-stranded linear, but it's not. It's a circle. Here's the origin of replication. And as we've said, the origin of replication is the site at which DNA synthesis initiates. SV40 requires the synthesis of one protein to initiate viral DNA synthesis. The virus gets into the cell. The genome gets in the nucleus. mRNAs are made from the viral genome, and one of those is translated in the cytoplasm to form a protein called large T or LT or just capital T. You'll see it uh, identified in a couple of ways throughout this week. And here's one bit of LT. Here's one molecule of LT, if you will. This protein goes back in the nucleus where 12 of them bind on either side of the origin of replication. Okay, so here's one LT, one large T, and six bind on one side, six bind on the other. So two hexamers of LT bind specifically. They recognize the origin of SV40 replication. This is what is now going to attract 
the cellular DNA replication machinery to the viral DNA. That T protein or T antigen is what tricks the cell into replicating it. Otherwise, it would have to compete with the chromosomal DNA and it would not do very well. So two hexamers of, of large T bind to the origin and they induce a conformational change in a very specific part of the origin called the EP. And that allows in an energy dependent manner a cellular protein called RPA, that stands for replication protein A, to bind and begin to denature this origin of replication. And that happens together with a cellular protein called topoisomerase 1. So, of course, to replicate the DNA, you have to denature it. You can't replicate a double strand. You have to get the single strands isolated, and that's what the function of this is, the binding of RPA and topo 1. And that can only happen when large T is bound. So you can see there's a series of events occurring here, a series of fortunate events for the virus that allow recognition of the origin of replication, first by large T, then by these proteins that help to denature the origin. And of course, this is going to set the stage for the DNA polymerases to come in and begin copying this origin. All right, so that's the first step. What happens next? A series of very interesting events. Now here again we have our uh, minimally denatured SV40 DNA, two hexamers of large T. We have molecules of RPA bound, and uh, this region's been denatured. Uh, the next thing that happens is we're going to add an enzyme to synthesize the RNA primers and a little bit of DNA. So that is a complex of, of uh, enzymes called polymerase alpha. So there are several DNA polymerases uh, in the cell that participate in this uh, process of DNA replication. And one of them is called polymerase alpha or Paul alpha. And, uh, and the enzyme that um, makes the RNA primers is called the primase. And those are these two proteins here, uh, Paul alpha and primase. And these recognize the single-stranded DNA. Uh, they displace RPA. And you see this, a, short, synth, a short, short piece of RNA is made. Uh, that's the green, which you can see here, here, and here. Now, of course, these are the leading strands. These are the first strands to be replicated. And its synthesis is going to be in a 5 to 3 prime direction uh, on both strands of the replication bubble. So you get RNA primers in green, then short DNA fragments. Those are in red, and those are made by polymerase alpha. Next, we have a couple of other proteins uh, binding, and these are called RFC, replication factor C, and PCNA. Uh, and, uh, and these two proteins come in and form kind of a moving clamp on the DNA, as you can see here. Actually, the PCNA makes a clamp around the DNA, and it slides down the DNA, and the polymerase rides on it in a way. And RFC helps PCNA to be loaded. And all this happens only after the RNA and the short DNA segments are made by Paul A primase. So RFC, PCNA, ATP comes in. They're bound here, but they're not going to make anything because they're not DNA synthesis enzymes. That's going to be done by polymerase delta. And this is the polymerase that can make long DNA. So now polymerase delta will come in and ride on this sliding clamp. And as you can see here, polymerase delta is in purple. It's riding on the clamp formed by RFC and PCNA, and it's making long DNA. So this is the processive DNA synthesis uh, on the leading strand. So again, we have an RNA primer, a short DNA made by Paul A primase, and then long DNAs. These are the leading strands on both strands of DNA made by polymerase delta. All right, so those are the leading strands. Now, of course, we have to make lagging strands. It's made by the same group uh, of proteins, RFC, PCNA, polymerase delta. Um, and, of course, the primers have to be made by um, Paul alpha primase, and the primers, the RNA primers, are in green. And then the lagging strands you can see here uh, are in lighter red. So here's one um, RNA primer, 
and the DNA made off of that. And here's another one here. So leading and lagging strands, leading and lagging strands. And eventually, you this whole bubble, say, will be copied to a double-stranded DNA form. We remove the RNA uh, sequences with RNA sage. Uh, we ligate the ends. We fill in the uh, DNA that's missing the gaps where the RNA was removed with the polymerase, uh, and then the ends are ligated. So now we have a complete double-stranded DNA copy in this entire bubble, and you can see the polymerase at either side here. And the primase is still here in our, our uh, RPA. And as this is happening, of course, the large T's are sliding along the DNA, so this is what the DNA replication machine looks like in action. This is the SV40 replication machine. Here is one replication fork. Here's large T hexamer bound to the template. And here the, the double-stranded DNA has been denatured. And here is one strand, the leading strand, that's been replicated by Paul Delta riding along on the clamp of PCNA and RFC. It started up here and has just copied the, the template. The template is light blue here and the product is red. And the lagging strand is shown on the right here. Here is uh, some uh, DNA binding protein bound to the single strand, keeping it uh, single-stranded. Again, the synthesis here is of a pink strand. It has to be in a five to three prime direction. Here's the RNA primer, and here is the extended DNA. And again, this is carried out by polymerase delta and uh, this is RPA, of course, which is maintaining this single-stranded. So this is an amazing replication machine. All of this deduced by studying SV40 in vitro, and it turns out that this is how we replicate our genome. So another great example of how the study of viruses has really shed light on cellular mechanisms. Uh, these are some of the proteins that we've talked about, just so you have a list of them to refer to. Uh, these are the ones that we've talked about that are important for SV40 DNA replication. Uh, RPA, the primase. DNA polymerase alpha, which joins with the primase to make uh, RNA primers and the short Okazaki fragments, both on the leading and lagging strands. Uh, RFC, uh, the clamp-loading protein. PCNA, the sliding clamp, the DNA polymerase that does the long DNA synthesis. Uh, and then the enzymes that degrade the primers and ligate um, the, um, the daughter DNA strands together. So if it's a good reference table for you if you're looking at those, uh, those previous images to see what's what. Now, as DNA is replicated as a circle, uh, two problems arise, and they are shown here. So here we have our covalently closed circular template. As we have discussed, in order to get... DNA replicated, you have to denature this double-stranded DNA, so you have to unwind it. And the unwinding part is shown up here in red. So you can imagine that in the middle here would be an origin of replication. We have a bidirectional replication fork uh, moving in both directions from the origin. And in so replicating the DNA, this region is unwound. As you unwind this double-stranded region, you introduce uh, coils in the rest of the DNA. You basically overwind it, and that's shown here by these coils. So you unwind the area of replication. The rest of the molecule gets more and more twisted as you unwind more and more. And eventually, that would be an impediment to the polymerase moving. This would be so tightly wound that the polymerase couldn't move through it anymore. So you need to nick this DNA and let it unwind and then reseal it. And that's done by topoisomerases, whose job is to, one of his job is to take these overwound regions out of DNA by cleaving one strand and relaxing the supercoil, as you can see here. And this happens periodically during replication, so you get a nice fluidly moving replication fork. The other issue comes at the end of uh, DNA replication, when you finally duplicated this entire molecule, by the topology of the molecule, the two are linked now within one another. The blue one is the template and the red is the new molecule. But you can't separate them because they are like segments of a chain. They're intertwined. So you have to cleave both strands with topoisomerase again 
and that is sep- allows it, the separation of the two product strands, and then of course they're both uh, the two cut parts are ligated together uh, by the topoisomerase. So topoisomerases are incredibly important at the end of DNA replication, uh, not only to remove the two products, but during replication to remove the overwound regions. So this is a summary of what I've just told you, the end of DNA synthesis. We separate the daughter molecules by decatenation of of TOPO2, by cleaving and resealing, and during replication, topos relax and unwind the supercoils. They relieve torsional stress caused by unwinding in the area of DNA synthesis.